The purpose of this video is to talk about balancing equations and to give a little background information about why we balance equations and, um, and then to go over the process for balancing equations. So we'll have a kind of a written description. It may be a little bit hard to follow, but um, I'm going to have another video where I actually go through and walk through that process with some examples. And so with this one, kind of focus on taking the notes and then on the other uh, the other video you can kind of see how the process works. So the first question here is is why are we balancing equations? And the reason why is it's the law. Okay. Now yeah it's the law of conservation of mass because if you remember we said with the law of conservation of mass um, we may change the substances that are, are involved here, but the atoms that make up the substances don't change because when we have a chemical reaction, we don't uh, create atoms, we don't destroy atoms, we just rearrange them. Um, in my class, I did a demonstration where we took water and we put it into a Hoffman apparatus and we separated it uh, chemically into oxygen and hydrogen. Well, when we did that, we started out with one substance, water, and we ended up with two different substances, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. But we never created atoms or destroyed atoms. We just put them in different combinations. So for balancing equations, the reason why we do it is if we're going to describe a chemical reaction in detail, we need to make sure we account for all of the atoms of each element before and after the reaction to make sure that we aren't describe it in ways that we've created or destroyed atoms. So before we start getting into the process, there's a few back, background terms that we should know. Some of these are ones that we covered earlier this year, and one of them is, is new, and it may be something you've heard of in math class, but not necessarily in chemistry class. Uh, the first one, of course, is a reactant. We covered this. Um, last month and we said well a reactant that is just one of the substances that's present before the reaction takes place it's it's one of your starting materials or maybe the starting material for a reaction and then we have the product and the product is a substance that's formed in the reaction and so when we're writing out these equations we will start in because um, in our language we read left to right uh, we're going to be writing our equations that way too so what happens first is we've got our reactants. They're going to be written first on the line. Then we'll write an arrow, and then the arrow will point to our products. Now, another term we've already talked about is subscript, and that's those little numbers that, that appear after the different elements in a, uh, in, a, in a formula, and they just show how many atoms of that element are in the substance. Now, the next term that's a new one is coefficient. And it will be a large number that appears in front of the substance, in front of the molecule or atom or formula unit that's in our equation. And what it tells us is how many molecules or formula units of that substance are in the reaction. So I'll give a little example here. Um, here we have water. And this time we have good old H2O. And we have a big number four in front there. Well, obviously, we have our subscripts here. We have a subscript of two. And we have the other arrow that's pointing to, it looks like it's pointing to nothing, but we understand that there's a one there. We don't bother to write it, but we understand that there's a one because uh, it, it's saying there's one oxygen atom uh, in this molecule. So water molecule contains two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and we get that information from our subscripts. Now the coefficient is that big number in front. Now that coefficient can be different. If we're talking about water, it's got to be H2O for the formula, saying how many atoms are in the water molecule. The coefficient can be different depending upon uh, what equation that we have. In this case, I've just put in 4 as an example. And the 4 indicates that in this example, we have 4 water molecules. And from all of this information together, we can find out information like how many hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms are represented right now in that expression at the top of the screen of 4H2O. And what it says is that we've got four water molecules and they contain two hydrogen each. Well, if they come two to a package and we've got four packages, well, that's four times two. We've got eight hydrogen atoms. 
And since that oxygen, again, that subscript, we don't bother to write it, but we know there's one there. Um, in water molecules, there's one oxygen per molecule. The four means we've got four molecules. The four times the one, of course, we've got four oxygen atoms. Now, another new term is skeleton equation. And a skeleton equation is just an unbalanced equation. It shows us all of the reactants and products, all of the substances that are going to be in our reaction. Uh, why is it called a skeleton equation? It's not just because around here, Halloween is right now right around the corner. Um, but the reason why it's the skeleton equation is that it's the bare bones equation. It's just showing what the substances are. There's no coefficients to show you um, how many of each uh, substance or in the reaction. So here would be an example right now of a skeleton equation. You can see we've got subscripts because they, uh, they are needed to describe which uh, substances we have in this reaction, but we have no, uh, no coefficients listed at all. How do we know it's unbalanced? Well, if we take a look at this equation, we know it's an unbalanced equation because of things like before the reaction over there on the left-hand side with our reactants, if we look at the total number of hydrogen, we've got four hydrogen atoms before this reaction. Over on the right with our products, we only have two hydrogen after. And likewise, we've got two oxygen atoms over on the left-hand side on our reactant side. But over on our product side, the, what we have after the reaction, we've got two atoms of oxygen in the carbon dioxide and we have a third oxygen atom in the water. So the process for balancing an equation is the first step is we are going to draw a box around each compound. Now this first step really is optional and it may be something that I find that my students uh, do better if they start out with this. Later on, as soon as you feel comfortable, you can stop drawing the box around each compound. And the reason why we do that is when we draw the box around the compound, it's to show us that we're not going to change any of the formulas of these substances. Because if we look at this first equation here, this, this first equation, I'll go back to this for a second. Um, this first equation is, is the skeleton equation for the combustion, the burning of methane. Methane gas is a major component of natural gas. So CH4 is our methane. In this reaction, we would say the methane gas is uh, reacting with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide and water. Well, one way we could get this to balance, because we said that it started out with four hydrogen atoms and ended up with two, we could get that to balance by changing that CH4 to a CH2. And to get the three oxygen atoms on each side, we could change the O2 to an O3, but all of a sudden we would not be describing the same reaction. So we really, really don't want to do this. This is something you don't want to do. And that's why sometimes it's helpful if we draw a box around each of the component or each of the, uh, of the substances in the reaction. That way it's a little reminder that says, we're not going to change anything inside the box. We're not going to put a number in the middle of CH4, and even a coefficient won't go in the middle. The coefficient will go at the very beginning of the substance formula, but it won't go in the middle. We won't change anything in the middle. We're not going to change any subscripts to get it to balance because that would change the fundamental reaction that's taking place. Okay. Our second step will be to put a vertical line below the arrow because this vertical line is going to separate kind of the before and after because over on the left hand side will be all of our reactants and that's everything we've got before the reaction takes place and everything on the right hand side will be what happened what we have after the reaction takes place so it's handy to kind of draw that vertical line so we can keep the two straight the third thing we'll do is we'll list all the elements in the equation the fourth step is we'll start with elements that show up in the fewest substances and then we'll take an element inventory kind of go in element by element and what I what I mean by starting with elements in the few with in the fewest substances is uh, sometimes um, a, an element will appear in one compound that's over on the reactant side and only show up in one compound that's on the product side 
And those are the ones we'd like to be able to start with because sometimes you get elements that show up in every single compound and you have so many choices of what to do to get it to balance that it, uh, you can kind of go in circles and kind of spin your wheels there. So it'd be better if we just started with the elements that show up in the fewest substances. Uh, it'll make everything else will work out. Then what we're going to do is we're going to change the coefficients. We'll change the numbers in front of each substance in order to get this to balance. And then we'll go on to the next element and repeat the process. And then we will check to see if any changes we make, because as we go through, there's a little bit of trial and error here where we'll change one coefficient to make something balance, but then it'll change our inventory of something we've already balanced, and we gotta go we gotta double check to make sure that we haven't upset something we've already balanced. And then at the very end, when we finally have everything balanced, we need to check all of the coefficients in the equation to make sure that they're in that lowest whole number ratio. So we may get it all to balance, but it may be we've got coefficients of 3, 3, and 6. And yes, it would be all balanced, but we would want to divide all of those coefficients by 3 to get them in a nice low whole number ra ratio. Now the last thing is, um, and this is another thing, these are things you want to put in your notes. If everything is balanced except for one element that's in the, in the equation in its elemental form, so it's just sitting there, so oftentimes this will be oxygen. You'll have everything in your equation all balanced except for the oxygen, and you can't quite get it to balance. You can, you are allowed to use fractions to get it to balance, and usually it'll be some half type fraction. Um, but once you get the equation balanced, you must go back and multiply all the coefficients by the same number, usually two, in order to get rid of any fractions. And so once we get it balanced, we're going to multiply everything by the same number to get it to whole numbers, kind of like what we did with, um, with empirical formulas. And uh, again, I would recommend uh, kind of stopping this video, getting these notes, or maybe pulling the, the process uh, screen up and pausing it and, and pulling up the other video, the one that gives you examples in another window, because I think a lot of this process is probably pretty abstract right now. You're probably having a hard time understanding what, what I'm getting at, and once you see some examples, it'll be a little clearer.